So, welcome doesn't, to the Christmas season. Doesn't it seem early all of a sudden? I, um, I woke up this morning, and in my early time, I grabbed my journal, and I kind of sat down, and I always, in my journal, I always write down the date in my journal, and then begin to, uh, you know, read some scripture and all of that. And the first thing that I wrote in my journal this morning was, I can't believe it's the 1st of December. Just seems like we were in December not long ago. And so this is, what a great time of year, and so um, we're excited about that. So this morning, we dive into the Christmas story, but we dive into the Christmas story with a twist this morning. Usually, during the Christmas season, we talk about the incarnation. We talk about Jesus' birth, the events surrounding his birth, the people involved in his birth, or, or maybe we go back and look at a few Old Testament scriptures and we study the Old Testament prophecies about the birth of Jesus Christ. But this year, we want to see the story of Christmas from a different perspective. Not a different story, but the story of Christmas from a different perspective. Now this morning it's important for us to realize that the Christmas story is not just a New Testament narrative. Sometimes I think that we erroneously think that the Old Testament tells us one story and the New Testament tells us another story. Often we view the two Testaments as if God had one plan in the Old Testament and that didn't work. So he had to come up with a different plan in the New Testament. His Old Testament plan didn't work, so here comes Jesus to salvage God's plan that didn't work in the Old Testament. That simply is not the case. Nothing could be further from the truth. God has one plan for redemption. God has always had one gospel that is clearly seen in both testaments as a matter of fact as far back as the fall of man in the garden of eden there in genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 god begins to lay out his plan for our salvation for the redemption of mankind so as i mentioned he begins to lay out his divine plan after the fall and slowly reveals bits and pieces of his divine plan until it is fully revealed in the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, so today we travel back to Old Testament times. We want to go back to a, a book that that might not be familiar to you. Some would call it a, a small, obscure book in the Old Testament, a small four-chapter book that's called the book of Ruth. And so if you have your Bibles, if you have your phones, your iPad, whatever, turn with me to the book of Ruth. It's found between the books of Judges and 1 Samuel. Judges and 1 Samuel. By the way, it's, it's, only, it's one of only two books in the Bible that are named after a woman. Can someone tell me the other? Esther. Esther. Only two books in the Bible named after a woman, Ruth and Esther. And if you are unfamiliar with the story, maybe, maybe for some reason you've never heard the story, you've vaguely heard it, you've never spent any time there, I'm convinced that by the time we get through with this book at the end of December, that you're going to fall in love with the story and you're going to clearly see how it ties in with the birth of Jesus. So pray with me today. Would you do that? Lord, today we, we come before you with sincere hearts. Lord, I pray right now that you do a work in each of our hearts, beginning with mine. Lord, help us to be sensitive today to the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, as we open up your word that has been inspired by the Holy Spirit, maybe, maybe a passage that we've never heard, maybe a passage that maybe isn't as well known as other passages, but I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would take your word, your story, your truth, and drive it home to our minds and to our hearts. Help us to realize today that you have a plan for our lives. It doesn't always go according to our plan, 
but it doesn't mean that you were not bringing about your plan in our lives. Help us to see that from the story of Ruth and help us to see that in our lives as well. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a little bit of background information because before we begin to read the first chapter. The author of Ruth is anonymous, unknown. You might sit back and think why Ruth wrote it. No, there's no indication in the text that Ruth wrote this. No one is listed as the author of this book. There are two possible suggestions that I would submit to you today. The first is that it was written by Samuel. Uh, that's the Jewish tradition, that it was written by Samuel. And, and uh, Jewish tradition states that, that Samuel not only wrote Ruth, but he also wrote the book of Judges, and that the book of Judges and Ruth were originally one book together. The other suggestion is that it was written by Solomon. Solomon, of course, David's son, wrote this book after his father's death, after David's death, for the purpose of tracing the lineage of his father. Kind of like we would get online today and we would get on Ancestry.com to kind of go back and, and see who our, our forefathers were. And we could, we could do all of that study so that we could tell our parents and our grandparents, here's where we came from. Some would suggest that David wrote, or excuse me, that Solomon wrote this book for that purpose. But we don't know because the book is anonymous. There's no author that is mentioned. The, this book tells us the, uh, uh, what is taking place during the time of the judges. As a matter of fact, we see that in the very first verse because the book starts off by basically saying, during the time of the judges. And for us to get a, an idea of what life was like during the time of Judges, we only have to go back to the very last verse of the book of Judges. You could flip one page back in Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, the very last verse makes this statement. In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Every time I read that, I think, boy, that's just like the day and age in which we're living, is it not? That's the way it was during the judges. There was no king. There was no spiritual leader. And every single person did what was right in their own eyes. And so as you can imagine, during the period of the judges, there was both spiritual as well as political anarchy. During the time of the judges, the land was dominated by relativism, just like today. What was truth for one person might not have been truth for someone else. People were trusting in themselves, and they were ignoring their covenant relationship with God. That, that's what was taking place when this book was written. The book of Ruth is a historical narrative. It's written in the form of a short story. So if you like to read short stories, you'll enjoy reading this book. It contains a very simple plot that revolves that, that revolves around three characters. We'll meet two of them in chapter one today. It revolves around Naomi, her daughter-in-law Ruth, and a gentleman that we will meet next week, a man by the name of Boaz. And you'll meet Ruth and Naomi in just a moment. Ruth anticipates the coming of a king to the throne of Israel. So remember we said that it was written during the time of Judges, and it says in Judges there was no king in Israel. Well, the book of Ruth anticipates the coming of a king to the nation of Israel in just a few short generations. But more importantly, it not only anticipates the coming of a king, those first kings, Saul and then David, it not only anticipates the coming of a king to Israel, but more importantly, it foreshadows the coming of the last and the greatest king, Jesus Christ himself. And we don't want to give all of that away. So the challenge, we've been doing a lot of study on the book of Ruth. They say the challenge in preaching, in preaching the book of Ruth is to not give away the end at the very beginning. All right, so I'm going to try my best to not give away the end today at the very beginning, but just catch this, that the book of Ruth anticipates the coming of Jesus Christ, and you'll see that as we walk through the book. So start with me, Ruth chapter 1. Today we're going to walk through the first chapter and see what takes place in this chapter. So notice, chapter 1, verse 1, I alluded to it just a moment ago. In those days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. 
Let me pause there for a second because they've debated when exactly do these events transpire in the book of Judges. And it doesn't tell us when. Some have speculated that it might have occurred during the time of Judges chapter 6. If you want to go back there and read that later. Judges chapter 6 verses 1 through 6. When the Israelites were being oppressed by the Midianites, it says that there was famine in the land. And so some have speculated that the events of Ruth chapter 1 take place during the time of Judges chapter 6. But we don't know that for sure. So there was a famine in the land. And a man of... Bethlehem, what else happened in Bethlehem that might tie to the Christmas story? A man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. The word sojourn there is really important to the text because it doesn't mean that they went to reside there. I just spoke in Spanish and the Spanish used the word reside. The idea is not that they said, okay, we're picking up all of our belongings and we're moving to this new country. No, because of the famine, it was just a temporary move. So here's what happened. This man is experiencing hunger with his family, cannot find food in Israel, and decides to pick up his family and transport them to Moab because there was food in Moab. That's what was taking place. And so, by the way, Moab was located to the east of Israel. If you have a map, there's the Mediterranean Sea, and then there's Israel. Moab was to the east of Israel. It was to the east of of, a, of the Dead Sea. It was a land that was occupied by Israel's enemies at this time. And yet Elimelech decides during this famine to pick up and take his family there. So they went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. Elimelech, his name means my God is king, which may give some indication as to the faith of Elimelech. And the name of his wife was Naomi. Naomi's one of the main characters in the story. Naomi's name means pleasant. Remember that because, because we'll see that at the end of our passage today. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. And they went into the country of Moab and remained there. So try to place yourself in, in this family's shoes. So uh, they, they're living in Bethlehem. There, there is a famine that takes place in Bethlehem. Elimelech cannot find food for his family. And so as a result, he picks up his family and leaves his country, travels east to the country of Moab, which was much more of a fertile land, and finds bread there. Now, as difficult as that would be for us in this day and age, it was 10 times more difficult during Old Testament times. We'll see at the end that the trip was, was dangerous and it was difficult. And he traveled there with his wife and with his two sons, Malon and Chilion, far away from their family, far away from their home, outside of God's protective hand over the nation of Israel. And notice what takes place in verse 3. Verse 3, but Elimelech, the husband of Noemi, died. And she was left with two sons. Man, I cannot imagine how difficult life proved to be for Naomi. She was now raising two sons in a foreign land. No family, no friends, no roots, no support system there. She must have felt all alone and abandoned by God. Certainly, I'm sure she thought, man, life can't get any worse than this. It's only going to get better from this point forward, right? Notice verse 4. These, or, or excuse me, the end of verse 3. But Elimelech, the husband of Noemi, died, and she was left with her two sons. We already read that. Verse 4. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years. So Elimelech dies, foreign country. Life seems to get better. It seems like they've established themselves. And, and Malon and Chilion, 
find these beautiful Moabite women. And by the way, you might sit back and think, I didn't think Israelites were allowed to marry outside of their descendants, and the Moabites were a little different. And if you're interested, we can talk about that at the conclusion of the service. But they found these Moabite women, and they married these Moabite women. And in Noemi's mind, okay, listen, I'm still mourning the death of my husband, but it seems as if life is beginning to, to get better. It's beginning to establish itself. We have a life here. My sons have found wives. I have two daughters, two daughters-in-law. And generally, when kids, when boys marry girls, what comes next? Grandkids. And so no doubt, knowing me is sitting back thinking, okay, Lord, I know, man, you've been difficult on me, but life is getting better. My sons are married, and grandkids are on the way. Woo-hoo! And notice verse 5. And Malon and Chilion died. As I read that, here's exactly what I wrote in my notes. What? I mean, as you read through the story, you sit back and think, oh my word. So there was famine. They moved, they transplant to a different country. The dad of the house dies. And then both the sons die as well. The Bible doesn't tell us what they died of. I mean, I want to sit back and think, were they in a car accident? Was there a plane crash? I mean, what happened with these guys? There's no indication in the text. Some say that their names might give us some indication. Malon means sick, and Chilean means destruction or wasting away is what his name means. But apart from that, we know nothing of these guys' death. And the last part of verse 5 simply says this, the woman was left without her two sons and without her husband. I read that and thought of that phrase, when it rains, it pours. In Spanish we say, llueve sobre mojado. How could such a tragedy have happened to this family? Weren't they Israelites? Weren't they part of God's chosen people, God's covenant people? Doesn't God promise to take care of his own people? And those are certainly questions that transcend time. They were questions that not only affected Noemi, but they're questions that affect us as well. Many times they affect us during this Christmas season, during the holiday season. And all of a sudden, we begin to question, what is it that God is doing in my life? As Noemi says later on in the passage, we'll see, God has been unfair to me. Why did I lose my job? Why am I struggling with my health? Why did my marriage fall apart? Why did my child die early? Doesn't God love me? Hasn't God promised to take care of me? And yet I'm experiencing all of these tragedies, just like knowing me. Please remember one thing, and the first point in your outline is simply this. God allows bad things to happen to his people. God allows bad things to happen to his people. God has never promised that your life would be trouble-free. Yeah, grab your Bibles. You can read the whole thing from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 all the way to the end of Revelation. You are not going to find one single promise where God says, you follow me, you become a follower of mine, and I will eliminate all of your problems. I wish that was found in Scripture. I wish the promise was there. But very simply, it's just not there. There's no warranty that God gives you when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, saying, okay, here's the warranty. You now will have a problem-free life. It's simply not the case. We recently saw in our study of the book of Habakkuk, in Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 2, and, and Brad brought that message when, when life just doesn't make sense. And we saw in Habakkuk 1-2 that Habakkuk cried out to God saying, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry out for help and you not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save. Church, church, listen. There are times when life doesn't seem to make sense. 
We want it to make sense. At times we feel like we, we need it to make sense. But just because it doesn't make sense to us doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense to God. Just because we don't know what God is doing doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan. Someone has said this. Let me kind of uh, chase a rabbit for just a second because someone has said that there are, there are four types of trials that as believers you and I will face. And, and, and I want to prepare you because you will have trials in your life. You might sit back today and say, man, Brian, tell me about it. You have no idea what I'm going through. You and I will have trials in our life, and generally we will experience one of four different trials. Let me give them to you. They're not up on the screen. The first is this, what we would call consequential trials. Consequential trials. Those are trials as a result of our own actions. I invested money in a bad investment and I lost the money. What's the reason for that? Well, well I made a bad decision. I, I made bad decisions in my life and as a result I'm living the consequences of those bad decisions. There will be times in your life and mine when we go through consequential trials. Paul describes it this way in Galatians 6, 7. He says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, you can finish the verse. What? That will he also reap. If you sow bad decisions, guess what you're going to reap? Bad decisions. I'm flabbergasted at times why people come in and they sit down and they want to talk about, Brian, why in the world is God allowing this to happen in my life? And when we sit back, we, we can trace bad decision after bad decision after bad decision, and now they're living the consequences of those decisions. Sometimes we sit back and think, no, but God's all-powerful, so God in his power should rescue me from my own stupidity. And he does that sometimes, but he doesn't do it all the time. There's consequential trials. There's a second type of trial. There's corrective trials. A corrective trial are trials that God allows to correct a sin or a wrong habit in your life or mine. In other words, God in his grace corrects those whom he loves, and he brings a trial into our life for the purpose of what? Of correcting us and putting us back on course. And sometimes we look at those as if they're, you know, retribution from God, but they're really God in his love caring for us. I've told you this story. I was just with my brother um, and his wife, Lisa. Vicky and I were up there for Thanksgiving, and Bruce and I were talking about how often we got paddled as a kid. And actually, Bruce actually has, I don't know why he has it, but he has one of the paddles that mom and dad used on us on a regular basis. And he said, do you want to see it? And I said, no, I don't want to see it at all. I was, I was terrified of it. I didn't want to see it, you know. But, but I remember my mom and dad always looking at me and, and saying, I, I mean, every single time before my dad paddled me, he'd look at me and say, now you know why I'm doing this, don't you? And I'm like, yeah, because you're ticked off at me, you know. But my, my dad would say, no, I'm doing this because I love you. And, and as a kid, you sit back and think, well, you got a funny way of showing your love but as a parent, you get it. Because you realize, man, I don't want my child to keep making these same mistakes over and over and over again. And so I do what? I try to correct them. That's what God does. Peter says this, whom the Lord loves, he what? He chastens, he chastises, he corrects. And so there's corrective trials in our life. Thirdly, if you're writing them down, there are constructive trials in our life. Trials that God allows in your life to make you a better person, to build your character in order to make you and I more dependent upon him. David talked about these type of trials in Psalm 119 and verse 67. He said this, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. In other words, David is saying, man, God, God had to use some trials in my life to put me back on the straight and narrow. And I'm thankful that he did because now I'm doing what I should be doing. And the fourth kind, if you're writing them down, are crowning trials. 
trials that God allows for the sole purpose of bringing glory to his name and accomplishing his glorious purposes. You might sit back and say, okay, Brian, how do I know which one it is in my life? Wouldn't it be great while you're going, going through a trial, you get an email from heaven that says, hey, Brian, just so you know, this is a corrective trial. It's like, oh, okay, thank you. I wondered what I was going through. Or, or, or for God to pick up the phone and leave you a voicemail. Hey, this is just to bring me glory. All right, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. He doesn't do that. So how do we know? We examine our life. As we go through trials, we sit down, as the Apostle Paul talks about, and we ask God, God, what is it that you're doing in my life? Is there anything in my life that you're trying to prune away, anything that you're trying to change? And we ask the Holy Spirit of God to give us clarity and to give us direction. As we get back to the story, we ask, okay, then, Brian, then what was it that God was doing in Naomi's life? Why did God allow her to suffer, you know, hunger or famine and then the loss of her husband and then tragically the loss of her two sons? Some would argue that these tragedies were the result of Elimelech's decision to leave Israel. I I read, as I read and studied this week, some actually made the statement if they had stayed in Bethlehem, Elimelech would have never died. And more likely, Malon and Chilion would have still been alive. We don't know that. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But I ask this question. Could it be, though, that God had a larger plan? Could it be that God was using something negative to accomplish something great through Ruth's life? through the descendants of Ruth's life. Man, 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 church, church, let me pause here because this is so practical. We need to sit back at times and something happens in our life and we get upset and we get mad and we do all of this not realizing that there is a sovereign God in heaven who is able to use even when someone treats me wrong and badly. He is able to use that in my life to accomplish good. That's why James says, count it all joy when you're going through difficult trials. Why? Because God is producing something in you. And at times we're so upset about what is happening, why God allows this to happen, why this is happening in my life, that we fail to see what God is doing in our lives. Realize this, church. God allows bad things to happen to his people. Doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It doesn't mean he doesn't love me. He's just working out his plan in our lives. That's what's taking place here. Keep reading with me, Ruth chapter 1 and verse 6. Then she arose. And so they're in this foreign land. Everybody's died. She's left with her two daughters-in-law. She arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Well, there's a a tremendous truth there I wish we had time to develop because one of the things that's demonstrated in the book of Ruth is, is that God not only works sovereignly in the lives of big, important people like kings and priests and all of that, but God sovereignly works in the lives of ordinary people like you and me. And, and, and so all of a sudden, God begins to work, and ordinary people were affected by what God is doing. And so Noemi hears. Evidently, one morning she got up, and she was drinking a cup of coffee, and she turned on the news, and, and it said the famine is over in Israel. Or she'd gotten an email or something like that. The famine is over. And so she tells her daughters-in-law, let's go back to Israel. There's food in Israel. Verse 7, so she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Noemi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. As I mentioned, the famine was over. Ruth decides to return. But it suddenly occurs to Ruth that her daughters-in-law should stay in Moab. 
By the way, she thinks, you guys aren't even from Israel. You're not from Bethlehem. You don't have any family there. And three times in the succeeding verses, she tries to persuade Orva and Ruth to return to their families. If you have your Bibles in front of you, in verse 8, she says, go, return to your families. In verse 11, she says, turn back. Why will you go with me? In verse 12, she says, turn back. Even if I had another son today, would you wait to marry him? By the way, this is referring to something that was called leveret marriage. Leveret marriage in the Old Testament was this, that if a husband died and he left his wife childless, it was the responsibility of a brother to assume the husbandly responsibilities and raise up children in his brother's name and so annoying me says you know what even if I was pregnant right now and I had a son today would you wait until he was old enough to marry you and thus produce children rhetorical question obviously says no you don't want to do that so notice what she says in verses 14 and 15 we jump down there verse 14 then, then the girls lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Both of them made their decision. No- Noemi tried to persuade them three different times. Go home. Go to your father's house. Go back to your country. And Orpha decides to return to Moab, but Ruth decides to stay. Here's the second truth I want you to get today. If you have your outline, the second truth is this. Your choices will determine your future. Obviously, your choices under the sovereign hand of God, because God is sovereign, but your choices will determine your future. This principle is clearly seen in the lives of Orpha and Ruth. So I want to take just a minute, and I want to talk about their decisions and the result of each of their decisions because it is clearly seen in the text. The first is this, Orpha decides to leave. And we just read a few moments ago that that Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, she wept, she loved her, but she decides to go back to Moab, she decides to go back to her father's house. As I read that, I thought, well, that seems like a no-brainer to me, right? I mean, I mean, why wouldn't she go back to her family in Moab? That's where her family was. That's where her people were. That's where her culture was. Why wouldn't she go back to Moab? And then I was reminded, though, that when she goes back to Moab, she not only goes back to her home, she not only goes back to her people, she not only goes back to her culture, but she goes back to the gods of Moab. And so as she returns to Moab, the the Moabites did not worship the God of Israel. The Moabites worshiped a God by the name of Chemosh. Chemosh was famous for asking parents to sacrifice their children. And so Orpha, in deciding to leave Noemi and go back to Moab, was not just leaving the mother-in-law that she loved and returning home. She was leaving a home that was steeped in following Yahweh, and she was returning to paganism. She was walking away from a relationship with the God of the universe. You sit back and say, okay, Brian, how would that decision affect her? It's really interesting. I've done some some reading this week. So Jewish tradition states, now, this is not biblical, and to be honest with you, I don't even think it's true. I've done a lot of research on it. But Jewish tradition, the Talmud, states that as Orpha left Ruth, or excuse me, Noemi and Ruth, and headed back towards Moab, she was met by a band of soldiers. And as she was met with those band of soldiers, she was sexually promiscuous with many of them. And Orpha became pregnant and gave birth to a son, Jewish tradition said, whose name was Goliath. And so Jewish tradition places Orpha and her descendants in direct contrast to Ruth and her descendants. Interesting, I don't think it's true. There's no indication of it in Scripture. So I don't want you to walk home and say, you're not going to believe what Brian told us today. All right, that's Jewish tradition in the Talmud. 
Here's what we do know, though. From a biblical context, Orpha is never heard of again. She walks away from the God of Israel, and she returns to paganism. Ruth, on the other hand, decides to stay. And Ruth's loyalty, we see it in the passage. I'm going to read a verse that you've heard before. You might not know that you've heard it, but you've heard it before. So Ruth's loyalty was not only to Noemi, or Naomi. I just spoke in Spanish. In Spanish, it's Noemi. In English, it's Naomi. All right? And uh, so, so, so Ruth's loyalty was not just to Naomi. Her loyalty was to the God of Naomi. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Read verses 16 and 17 with me. Notice what she says. But Ruth says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. And what does she say? Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts between me and you. One of, one of the most beautiful descriptions of loyalty, not only in Scripture, but in all of history. As a matter of fact, this description of, of, of uh, loyalty is so beautiful that many wedding vows have this in them. Some of you in your wedding vows might have made those vows, where you go, I go, your people will be my people. That's found in many wedding vows. It's one of the most beautiful statements of commitment in recorded history. But Ruth's decision to follow Noemi was a decision also to follow Yahweh. Because it's interesting the word that she uses for God. When she looks and she says, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Guess which term she uses? And Yahweh will be my God. She uses the Hebrew, the covenant name for God that God had given to his people. Your God will be my God. Catch this, church. Ruth's decision to follow Yahweh, the God of Israel, would dramatically affect her life. Dramatically affect her life. And not only would dramatically affect her life, but it would dramatically affect the life of her family. And not only that, but it would affect the destiny of her family as well. Here's what I wrote in my notes. Wow! Wow! That is so powerful. As I read this, a song came to my mind that we sang as a little kid. Some of you might know the song. You can sing along with me. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. That's what Ruth did. I've decided to follow life, her destiny was forever changed. What a principle for us. Youth today, let me challenge you. Make the decision now to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Married couples, let me challenge you today. Make the decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Parents, make the decision to raise your children to be followers of Jesus Christ. Your decisions will forever affect your future and will affect the future of your families as well. I meet with people and parents all the time that sit back and say, Brian, my kids don't want nothing to do with God and I'm trying to figure out why. And you sit down and you have conversations with these parents and you see the decisions that they have made all along and how those decisions have affected the future of their kids. Your decisions, obviously under the sovereignty of God, will determine your future. And not only your future, but the future of your family well. There's one more principle that I want you to see, and then we'll be done. Jump down to verse 19. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. So Ruth and Noemi go on. They travel from Moab 
to Bethlehem. It was, a distance, it was a distance of some 50 miles. Remember, there was no, you know, Amtrak. There was no planes. There were no cars. They walked that. They say the journey was incredibly perilous, was incredibly dangerous. It took them seven to ten days to walk from Moab back to Bethlehem. But God protected them in the journey. And they arrived in Bethlehem. And it says this, when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women of the town said, is this Naomi? Remember, so, so we view Bethlehem today. If you go to the city of Bethlehem today, it's a large city. But during Old Testament times and even New Testament times, Bethlehem was just a small little village. All right, and so the women of the town said, oh my word, is that Naomi? Why, Naomi has come back. The women said, is this Naomi? And Naomi said to them, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? Remember, what did Naomi mean? Pleasant. She said, why call me Naomi? Why call me pleasant? Call me Mara, which means bitter. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So I mentioned Naomi's name meant pleasant, but life for Naomi was no longer pleasant. She lost her husband. She lost her children. She lost her home. She stood empty. She blamed God for it. She says in the text, why has God done this to me? So Naomi says, from now on, don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. She was bitter. She was broken. Believing God himself had turned against her. So here's the question. My third principle is a question. And it's simply this. Bitter or brutally honest with God? What was Naomi? Was she bitter? Or was she just being brutally honest with God? Listen, I get it. There's a fine line between bitterness and grief. There's a fine line there. But I do believe that the Lament Psalms, and one of these days we're going to do a series on the Lament Psalms, but the Lament Psalms teach us that you and I can be honest with God. You and I can express our hurts we can express our confusion. We can express our grief. So here's what I believe, and, and, and not everybody believes like me, but here's what I believe. I believe that Naomi's heartache didn't affect her faith. I believe that yes, she was broken. Yes, she was contrite. Yes, she was confused. Yes, she had no idea what God was doing in her life, but that did not affect her faith. Let me pause there for a second and say, we can question what God is doing in our lives. We can sit back and in conversations with God say, God, I don't get it. God, it doesn't make any sense. Why are you treating me this way? Why are you allowing the family to go through this? Why am I suffering in this way? God, I just don't get it. You're not treating me fairly. I've loved you. I've cared for you. And this is the way you treat me. We can do that and not lose you say, Brian, how do you know Noemi didn't lose faith? Notice how she described God in the passage. Verse 21, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me? And here's the term, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. Guess what name she uses for God? El Shaddai. She looks and she says, I don't get what God is doing. I don't know why his hand is heavy against me. But El Shaddai, God, the all-powerful God, has allowed this to happen to me. I believe that she was simply being brutally honest with God. If the story ended there, you and I would think, oh my word, Naomi led. I lived the remainder of her days a bitter old 
If all there was to the story of Ruth was Ruth chapter 1, we would walk away and say, man, that poor lady. She lived bitter, unhappy, resentful for the rest of her days. But that's not what happens. And the story doesn't end after Ruth chapter 1. You sit back and say, so Brian, what happens? You got to come back next week to hear the rest of it. You got to come back because here's what God does. God in his sovereignty, catch this church, God in his sovereignty takes extreme pain. Pain that maybe only a few of us here in the auditorium can understand. The pain of not only losing a husband, but the pain of losing both of her sons. The pain of losing all of her children. And God takes that pain and he begins to sew it together. And he takes this piece and this piece and this piece and sews it together and does something so miraculous in Noemi's life that she could never begin to imagine what God would do. Paul says this, Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. You guys are a really smart crowd. What does all things mean? All things. You mean, Brian, when someone treats me in a wrong way? All things. Well, when I get fired and I don't deserve it? All things. When, when I come down with an illness and it doesn't make any sense? All things. When Brian, man, when, when I'm sick and I have to take care of a child who's sick and I got all, all things. God has a way of taking all things using them for good in our lives. So, so we, have, we have an option. We can respond one or two ways. We can sit back in faith and say, God, I don't understand it. It's hard for me. I don't want to embrace it, but I trust you. Or we can get bitter about it. We can sit back and say, don't call me Brian. <laughs> call me Mara. <laughs> Don't call me this, call me this, because I am bitter. And we fail to realize that there is a sovereign God in the universe that is using everything, everything for our good. And if, if Naomi would have sat back and wrote her story, as an Israelite hoping for the coming Messiah, she would have never, ever, 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 ever dreamed what God would do through her and through her descendants. Her challenge was to trust God. So here's the application today. Here's the application. God had not abandoned Noemi. As a matter of fact, there's a ray of hope. So chapter 1 kind of ends gloomy, but notice verse 22. So we read all of that, what Naomi said, verse 22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came back to where? To Bethlehem. By the way, Bethlehem means house of bread, house of God's provision. So they left. They had gone out during a time of famine, but they came back to the house of bread. Where what? It was the beginning of barley harvest. You say, what in the world does that mean? Come back next week and you'll find out. Because it all ties together. It all ties together. Here's the application, and I'm done. God didn't abandon Noemi. Catch it. He didn't abandon Noemi, and he will not abandon you. He will never abandon you. His steadfast love and his perfect plan for your life 
is fulfilled in the midst of both tragedy and triumph. So what do we do? We learn to trust him no matter what. Why is that? Because he's up to something. He's up to something in your life, and he's up to something in my life. When we submit to him and allow him to accomplish it through our lives. I submit to you today, and I'm done with all of this. I submit to you today, one of the, the greatest tragedies in life, one of the greatest tragedies in life is not, and I haven't gone through it, so please don't accuse me of being callous and car. I mean, I can't even imagine what it's like to lose a son. I can't imagine what it's like to lose a spouse. I can't even begin to imagine how tragic that is. But, uh, but a tragedy that is greater than that is for someone in whom God Almighty desires to work. And because of their lack of trust, they turn away they walk away from God and they never allow God to fulfill in them what he desires to do trust God Brian I don't get it trust God it doesn't make sense trust God it's not fair trust God Brian I'm mad trust God God works out everything he does it for knowing me, and he does it for Ruth, and he does it for you and me. Would you stand with me today, and let's close in prayer. This is one of the great stories of the Old Testament. It's a truth we all have to grapple with. I think I've told you before, I mean, there's, there's been times in my life when I've wrestled with God. I told you, I, I've told you before the story when we were in Mexico City and we found out all the details of our daughter, Amber. And I had nights that I wrestled with God. How dare you? How dare you treat me this way? And yet God in his perfect plan has brought his perfect will into our lives. And I can sit back now and say, okay, God, now I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. I'm trusting you. In the midst of the darkness, it's hard to see the light. But that's when we put our eyes on Jesus and we don't take our eyes off of him. Lord, thank you so much for the story of Ruth. And God, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts today. God, help us to examine our lives. God, is there any bitterness in our life? God, are we mad at you? Are, are we mad at someone else? Do, do we fail to see what you're doing because we're looking at the situations that are so painful and so close up that we cannot see beyond them to see what you're doing in our lives? God, I pray that you'd lift the blinders today. Help us through the power of the Holy Spirit of God to see and understand at least what you're trying to accomplish in our lives. And God, help us to trust in you. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love and your care, your steadfast love, even in the midst of tragedy. Help us to trust in you today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.